seems obvious, simple, common. But I struggle. It's subtle, profound, maddening. Philosophers call free will a big question, an open issue that explores the deep nature of reality or human existence. Big questions have big problems. Philosopher Al Mealy, leader of the Big Questions in Free Will project, explains. We find people claiming it's obvious that there's no free will, that is, that free will is an illusion. We find people claiming it's obvious that there is free will, there's no doubt about it. Depends on what you think free will means. If you think of free will as a supernatural power, then uh, any evidence against the existence of supernatural powers would count as evidence against the existence of free will. So if you set the bar really high for free will, you're going to have a problem about its existence. So suppose that you don't deserve to be punished unless you have free will. Well, where do you set the bar for free will? Is it a supernatural power? If so, and if there aren't any supernatural powers, then nobody has free will, nobody deserves to be punished. Um, do you set the bar? Is free will an illusion? Is free will required for legal punishment? What is it about the problems of free will that makes free will a big question? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. Usually, the more we think about things, the more we understand them. But the more I think about free will, the less I understand it. This I do get. Free will probes the big question of what it is like to be a human being. So Al Mealy invites me to Florida State University for a gathering of philosophers and scientists in his Big Questions in Free Will project. The prize-winning essay intrigues me. Is neuroscience the death of free will? As an old neuroscientist, I meet the author, philosopher Eddie Namias. Eddie, what is it about free will that makes it a big question? Free will lies at the heart of our conception of ourselves and our conception of being morally responsible agents. So if people feel like they have free will, they feel like they're in control of their lives and they feel like what they do matters. And if they don't feel like they have free will, they feel like what they do is not making an impact on the world. And that relates to our conceptions of moral responsibility. If you're not responsible or if you think other people aren't responsible, then presumably you think they're less blameworthy for bad things and less praiseworthy for good things. And it might end up affecting the way we understand legal responsibility as well. How about the other direction? Is free will then a, a kind of a probe of, of what mentality and consciousness itself is? Well, I think free will is intimately tied up with consciousness and our sense of ourselves as uh, being aware of you know, our own agency and, and place in the world. Only conscious creatures can have free will. And I think that understanding free will is a way of understanding our consciousness of ourselves and our actions. Um, so, so it goes both directions. Yeah. Uh, which is more fundamental? I think consciousness is because I think in order to have free will, you have to be conscious of possible futures, possible mm -hmm. ways that you could act. I like to define free will as a set of capacities that we have, and largely cognitive capacities, capacities to think in a certain way, but also capacities to control our actions in a certain way. The cognitive capacities have to do with being able to envision or consciously represent alternatives for action and to reflect on your own reasons and desires for choosing each of those actions. And then the actional component is to be able to control your actions in light of the choices you make. It's one of the things that makes us different from most other animals. I think some animals have some degree of those capacities, but we have more of it. So considering free will's extreme importance to humanity, where did it come from? And a lot of people think of uh, free will as a God-given ability, especially religious people. Um, as a naturalist, 
I think free will and the capacities involved had to evolve. I have a little story about how that might have happened, if you want to hear it. I always like fairy tales. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it might be that, because evolutionary uh, psychology is a very difficult thing. But what we see is in our nearest ancestors, there are abilities to uh, cooperate with each other. And reciprocal altruism was very important in our primate ancestors. Mm -hmm. But once you have the ability to cooperate in that way, you also have a motivation to cheat. Um, because cheating is a way of getting a little bit more out of a cooperative exchange than you give. But as soon as you have that evolutionary pressure, there's going to be a lot of evolutionary pressure to detect deception. And so I think what we saw in our primate ancestors is the ability to recognize other agents' minds. It's called theory of mind. And once you have that ability, you are able to represent mental states. That is, you can represent what desires other animals have, or other humans eventually. Um, and therefore, you can probably represent your own mental states. And because I think representing your own mental states and representing future states that don't exist yet is crucial to free will, I think those were the stepping stones to being able to have the capacities for free will. And so in a strange sort of sense, the evolution of being able to lie is what made us free. I think free will and To Eddie, to science be. helps explain free will, not explain it away. He argues that the free will debate should focus on threats posed by neuroscience. But why is neuroscience a threat? Isn't truth truth, however it turns out? Eddie's naturalistic theory of free will stresses awareness of possible futures, and he speculates that the evolution of lying engendered free will. Now, that would take free will down a peg, wouldn't it? Would free will still be a big question? What is it about free will, anyway, that makes it a big question? I ask philosopher Tim Bain, who defends the unity of consciousness. There are two reasons why free will is a big question. The first is related to ethics and questions about moral responsibility. Many, many people uh, draw a fairly direct line from free will to moral responsibility. The line being that uh, if we don't have free will, or if we don't have something close enough to our intuitive conception of free will, then we're not morally responsible. The second reason why free will is important concerns what, what the philosopher Wilfred Sellers called the manifest image. So it's a wonderful distinction. So Sellers distinguished the manifest image from the scientific image. Um, and the scientific image is the image of human beings that we get from the natural sciences. Uh, the manifest image is the image of human beings that's reflected in our experience of ourselves, mm. and perhaps to some degree our language. And we experience ourselves as creatures with free will. Uh, we experience ourselves as having the liberty to raise our hands when we want to. And lots of people have thought that there's a clash between the manifest image and the scientific image. That one of these things has to give. And why is that? One reason people think there's a clash is because they think we experience ourselves as something like uncaused causes, I think. And some people think the science says we're not uncaused causes. Everything has a cause, everything and you has a roll cause. it back far enough, you can show a sequence of events which causes everything in the physical world. Exactly, exactly. You can trace every cause back. Now, one way to reconcile these two levels is to say the science doesn't say that everything has a cause. My own work has focused more on trying to identify what the manifest image says. Do we experience ourselves as uncaused causes? I'm not convinced that the sense of being an uncaused cause is built into our everyday experience of, of well, being, of being What a difference free. does it make what the sense is? It's what the reality is. Well, if you think that the big question here is the need to reconcile, then the question is, what is it that you need to give up on in, in the manifest image. So, or if, how you have to change the science. But I don't think that there's such a difficulty reconciling the two. Because you're degrading the free will. But I don't think I'm degrading it. 
Well, of course not. That's the thing. Uh, so <laughs> you think you're think... searching for the, the truth, but you're privileging the science over the psychology. To my mind, the, the key issue here is what is actually in the content of the manifest image. So many people working in this field, especially the scientists, think that we experience ourselves as uncaused causes, and that generates a problem that needs to be reconciled. But if you say, we don't experience ourselves as uncaused causes, if, if, if one says that description of our phenomenology is wrong, we experience ourselves as having control over what we do, but we don't experience our actions as uncaused, then the problem of reconciling these two levels um, is, is, is largely, um, is, is much easier, much, much easier, um, because you don't have the manifest image saying we're uncaused causes, the science saying all causes have causes. Um, so the important question, I think, is the one that rarely gets asked. People assume a certain picture of the manifest image, but I think the picture they assume is often seriously mistaken. What is actually in the content? Tim's reconciling argument works. It harmonizes our sense that mental decisions are an uncaused cause with the scientific sense that every cause requires a prior cause. But it works only because Tim weakens free will. He doesn't think so, but I do. I may be naive here, but my personal manifest image is indeed as an uncaused cause. So why is this phenomenology, my own feeling, deceptive? And if it's wrong, it would seem a disturbing misperception of reality, calling into question anything we know from inner subjective awareness. Tim may be right. Free will of the full-blooded kind, where I could always do other than that which I do, would be an illusion. I'd not be thrilled though my existential emotions do not move reality. Have we pushed analytic philosophy to its limits? How else to probe the essence of free will? If free will is a big question, shouldn't it link to moral judgment? I explore this with an experimental philosopher, Joshua Nob. Joshua seeks clues to how we think by exploring what we believe. Josh, if there is no free will, then how can we hold people accountable? First, we decide whether people have free will, and then based on that, we make this moral judgment. So we might say, he has free will, so he can be to blame. In some cases, it can actually go the opposite direction. You make a moral judgment, and so based on that, you think that the person did it freely. If you made the opposite moral judgment, you think they were forced. So it might be that it's because we regard certain things as morally wrong that we end up seeing the pe people who did them as free. So we conducted various different kinds of studies showing that it's only when you regard something as being morally wrong that you think the person did it freely. One of the studies we did actually used a famous example from Aristotle's work. Yeah. So the story is, imagine this sailor out at sea, and he sees there's a huge storm coming. The only way that he can save his ship from capsizing, from falling over, is to just jettison his wife's expensive cargo from the ship. <laughs> if he doesn't do this, the ship's just going to turn over and everyone's going to die. So then, he, thinking quickly, he just throws the cargo into sea, the cargo falls to the bottom, and then he's able to survive and go home safely. And then participants were asked, did he freely throw the cargo, or was he forced to do that? People overwhelmingly say, he didn't do it freely, he was just completely forced. Yeah. Yeah, because he had no choice, because people were going to die, and the, the, it was much more important to keep people alive than all his wife's expensive stuff. Right, so then, in the other condition, we just switched out his wife's expensive cargo for his wife. So, <laughs> so he sees this huge storm is coming. The only way that he can save the ship is to throw a large object over the ship. He looks around. The only thing he can see is his wife. So he throws his wife over. She falls to the bottom of the sea. And then he's able to go home safely and evade the storm. And then in that condition, people are asked exactly the same question. Right. Was he forced to do this or did he do it freely? Everything else is the same except the moral significance of the act he performed. Yeah. But people have completely the opposite intuition. Right. They say, he did that completely freely. Yeah. He wasn't forced in any way. Right. So maybe somehow 
whether we did something freely is not something we can figure out first and then make the moral judgment. It's that because we regarded it as wrong, we think that the person did it freely. So you, the claim would be almost the opposite of what the common assumption is. Common assumption is you have to know what free will is first so you can judge moral judgment. Exactly. So if you think about people who have engaged in immoral activities, say on behalf of the government, people who are involved in the Nazi death camps, for example, you might ask the question, did they do that freely or were they just forced to do it? Probably if you regard these things as immoral, you think, well, they could always have just refused to obey orders. But if you think they're morally fine, then you'll say, no, they were completely forced by the situation. <laughs> so what is the implication of that? That's frightening a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on your point of view. So one implication seems to be, if uh, we learn more about uh, how our brains work and we start to see ourselves as being more determined, nonetheless, we're still going to think that people who engage in immoral behaviors are doing so freely because we'll just change our understanding of what it is to be free so that those behaviors end up being regarded as Well, free. you're making the assumption that the common human perception of common people is a proper one. Oh, all I was saying is that regardless of whether it's proper, no matter what you learn in the newspaper about neuroscience, you're still going to hold murderers morally responsible for what they're doing. It's not that doing these experiments is going to somehow resolve the entire debate and we have no need for any other form of thought. It's that this will add one extra tool to the philosopher's toolbox, allowing us in certain cases to see that some of the intuitions that we were employing in our philosophy might be actually off base. Skeptical at first to experimental philosophy, I bend a bit. Suppose our common beliefs do affect our thinking about free will. What follows? Only this. Common beliefs and thinking are not always coherent, and human mentality is not always internally consistent. But little else follows. Then, caution. Do not jump from common beliefs to grand conclusions about free will. What's needed is the hard work of analysis of language and meaning, the turf of philosophers. But some claim that problems of free will arise because philosophers deviate from common beliefs. Okay, I'll follow that trail. How then is free will a big question? I asked psychologist Bertrand Molly, who examines the cognitive tools that humans use in social interaction. The first reason why free will is a big question is because humans struggle with understanding it. Humans have this need to explain, understand where something comes from. They have to find meaning. And to postulate something like free will helps you understand why certain actions are unique, why certain things are unpredictable, why certain things are new, because somebody freely, creatively did something that you didn't expect would happen before. Now, most philosophers think that they understand free will. Now, each has their own approach, and there's great disagreement. So the kind of research that you do, can that help us with that problem? I think that the disagreement among philosophers is in part because they have deviated far from an ordinary concept of free will. And in my work, what I'm trying to do is first find out, well, how do people really conceptualize free will? Which also sometimes just means how do they conceptualize an intentional action that was freely performed? Because for ordinary people, there isn't much of a difference. There are so many quotes you can find of neuroscientists and philosophers talking about ordinary meaning of free will as entwined with the soul and dualism and metaphysical and indeterminism and uncaused cause, and we find none such thing. Ordinary people, when asked what free will means, tell you that it's a choice that you make with either without constraints or with the power to overcome constraints. You think about your choice before you do it, and it's in line with your desires, with your reasons. It's a fairly straightforward concept. So philosophers have to recognize that when you use the word free will, that they are bound to a community of speakers, and then, taken as a starting point, they can justify and argue to expand that concept and to change it, and maybe to challenge the concept and talk about how people using that concept 
speak incorrectly about reality. Then that becomes a discussion point we can but take But you start on. with the benchmark, which is what ordinary people think about free will. Right. So what do they think about free will? Well, they th ordinary people think that free will is something that we are capable of. It's a capacity. There are options. You can go this way, you can that way. And then you decide, you take one path. The choice is the fundamental concept that underlies free will. And very rarely do people actually use the term free will. They say, he acted freely and she made a choice and she freely chose that or she did not. Free will is almost a contradiction because the will is not really free. The action is free because it's based on the will. That would be a, a summary of the ordinary concept. Well, that's one of the... So common people believe that free will is a capacity and they ignore neuroscience, philosophy, theology. So what follows here? Common people believe that the atom is a tiny solar system and they ignore quantum mechanics. And on both, they are wrong. Common people's belief is interesting as folk psychology, but means little in discerning reality. Am I too taken by philosophy and neuroscience? Perhaps there is wisdom in common sense. For all their sophistication, philosophers are still locked in endless debates. To examine free will as a basic human trait, I visit a leading social psychologist, Roy Baumeister. Roy, how do you look upon free will and why is it a big question? I think of free will as a new kind of con controlling and producing behavior, uh, a new system or a new inner process that produces behavior uh, that was produced by evolution, uh, but that sets us apart from other creatures. Um, we have basic desires the same as they do. Every animal gets hungry and when it gets hungry it wants to eat. We do that too, but we might refrain from eating because we're on a diet or it's a religious holiday or the food belongs to someone else or all these other things that uh, might, not, might not matter to other creatures. So uh, importing these ideas and meanings creates different possibilities uh, and enables us to change our behavior based on these things. It seems then free will cuts really deep to what it means to be human. I think so, yes. Uh, free will is one of the basic human traits. I think that's why, too, some people are going around saying there's no such thing as free will, it's an illusion, blah, blah, blah. I think people are upset by that, uh, partly because it takes, uh, it, it denies one of the basic facts uh, of human experience. Uh, my goal as a, a research psychologist is to figure out what is the, the real process, what happens inside the mind and so forth that produces the behavior. Uh, I'm assuming the, the idea of free will has social value, it's, it's important, it it's corresponds to some real phenomenon. I got in studying free will by virtue of my research on self-control. Mm. Uh, we had found that uh, uh, self-control seems to depend on a limited kind of energy. Self-control is difficult, so it depletes uh, some energy, and after that you're not as good at self-control until you, you replenish. Uh, when we found that the same energy is also used for decision-making and initiative, and I said, okay, well, this is bigger than self-control, that's when we started talking about free will. But the common theme uh, is that, I presume, evolution uh, through nature found a way to take the body's energy, translate it by means presumably of brain activities and so on, into a new kind, uh, new ways of controlling behavior that are much more suited uh, for living in culture uh, and uh, information-rich societies. Culture is a new way of being social, of sharing information, of having interactive roles, passing information and knowledge on to future generations. So I assume that the distinctively human traits are pretty much all evolved adaptations to enable us mm -hmm. to do these traits. And so uh, I think free will uh, should be understood in that way as, a, as an adaptation for human social life. So, what does it mean for free will to be a big question? Whatever free will really is affects what human beings really are. In other words, free will offers insight into the essence of human existence. And what is it about free will that makes it a big question? Free will enables decision-making, 
establishes self-control, undergirds moral responsibility, justifies legal punishment, energizes culture as a new way of being social, and characterizes consciousness. If there ever would be meaning and purpose in human existence, free will would be one window through which to see it. But with all the promise, free will is elusive. Whenever you think you've got it cornered, like a mirage, it fades away. Yet free will, I know, brings us closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com. This program was supported in part by a grant from the John Templeton Foundation.